My name is Hector, and I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and I'm excited to be with you. Uh, on the day of the closing ceremonies of the Olympics, uh, anybody been watching the Olympics lately? Yeah? Okay. Uh, we're dominating. That's all I want to say is we're dominating in medals, and that's really what I wanted to see, and we're seeing it. And also, we dominated at basketball, which really, really matters. Um, no, we did great, and uh, Steph Curry's amazing, Golden State Warriors all day. Anyway, uh, I'm sorry if you're a, a Lakers fan in the room. Um, but hey, uh, today I'm excited. Uh, today we're going to continue on this series called Finding Joy. And uh, honestly, like the, the premise of this entire series is this idea that happiness is different than joy. Happiness is momentary. We're not talking about happiness. We're talking about joy. And joy is a state of mind, a perspective in life. And so uh, what we want to do is we kind of want to reframe some of our perspective during this series into finding joy in life. And today we're going to be talking about the, the message in our messes, the message in our messes, because uh, can I just tell you that there is a message in everything that you have gone through. There is a message that God is declaring, and today we're going to be talking about that. And so um, as, as we kind of just start off, can I just ask this question? Do we have any competitive people in the room? Any competitive people in the room? Okay. Oh, we've got, we've got a few. Okay. Um, I'm not. I'm not. Um, it's actually very frustrating for competitive people when I'm the one playing the game because I'm just trying to have fun, which I thought was the point. Um, but but uh, they're like, no, this is to win. Um, but uh, no, I'm not a very competitive person, but I, I, I have been competitive in portions of my life. Uh, when I was in high school, um, I looked at every sport that I could possibly participate in, and, uh, and I chose track, okay? Um, I chose track because I figured uh, tryouts maybe weren't as existent as a freshman. And so I was like, let's go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna join track. And so I, I actually uh, joined the sprinting team first. This is just a side note. I, I joined the sprinting team first. And uh, my first like three or four days, um, and like, I kid you not, every freshman makes it. Um, and I, I just, I remember uh, one of the first days of practice, I guess I just had like a funny sprint and I just wasn't really good at the sprinting part, like getting faster than everybody. Um, and so then, uh, I'm, I'm in the locker room, and my coach comes over to me and says, hey, man, have you, uh, have you tried the chess team? And, and this early 2000s, okay, like, it was a different time. But, um, but the, he looked at me, he's like, have you tried the chess team? The problem is I had, and I sucked. And so I was like, let me try to figure something else out. So then after that, um, I, I joined long distance, okay, which is completely different. Um, and, uh, you know, I had a few friends there, which at least like there was a side of community there. And, uh, and so I, I joined the long distance team. That means mile, two mile, um, 1,600, 3,200, and um, 800. And, and so I was like, okay, like I, I like this team. Like, you know, we don't have to sprint there. You know, we just could kind of go and oh, it's going to be great. And so we, uh, we, during our practices, we did like three miles, five miles, and uh, it, it felt great. You know, I started learning how to, how to really condition my body in a way that I could run long distances. But the problem was uh, I was a freshman and uh, I wasn't the most talented freshman. So I never really had the pressure to get in, in the first, second, or third places. But then one day, we were going to go against this new school. Now, if you don't know this, uh, when a school is new, like it's up and coming, they just built it, um, there's only freshmen and sophomores, typically, when they're starting up the school. So this new school in our district just popped up, and they were going against us, and uh, their varsity was sophomores, and their JV was freshmen. I had a chance. And so, and my coach made sure I knew about it. Uh, he was like, hey, man, if there, is, if there is a time to win, this is it. And I was like, let's go. So, um, so I remember uh, that day, you know, I was, uh, I was warming up and I was getting my mindset and, uh, and I get up to the, to the starting line and I'm, I'm thinking about that verse because, you know, I was a pastor's kid, so they had to remember verses a lot. And so then one of the verses I remembered is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking straight, I'm ready, I'm looking at everybody else, and I'm like, I got this. 
And so I'm off, right? And, uh, and right in the very beginning, I'm like eighth place, seventh place, right? And, uh, and then somewhere around the third lap, which there was four, or somewhere around the third lap, I ended up in third. I don't know how I got there, but I did. I ended up in third. How did I know? There was only two people ahead of me, so I knew. But the, the, the second place guy was way too far. So I was like, okay, I'm not going to be that ambitious today. Um, but I, I look at this guy, and I'm like, okay, as long as I stay the same distance from him the entire time, I keep this pace, I'm going to be just fine. We go to the, third lap, or to the fourth lap. And everything in my head is saying, hey, all I've got to do, all I've got to do is keep this pace, and I'm going to be perfectly fine. Now, if you've ran track before, you know what I just said is not what you're supposed to do. Because in the last 200 meters, right in the straightaway of getting there, I'm running the same pace thinking as long as I go this fast, I'm going to be just fine. And I kid you not, I just see one, two, three. I'm in sixth place. And I'm like, what just happened? And, and so then I get to the very end, and I went from third to six in literally like seconds. And my coach is mad at me. He's like, hey, what happened? I'm like, you didn't tell me to sprint. You know they kicked me off that team. And so um, I, was, I, was, I was very, very upset. And, uh, and it was not the best day of my life. But I, I thought about the fact that uh, this was something that I did was right before Han, I was like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And this is something that we see in a lot of competitions, in a lot of different contexts. Maybe even you have only known a little bit about Christianity and have known a little bit about church and Jesus, but you know about this verse. And you've probably heard it and you've probably seen uh, the citation of Philippians 4.13 on somebody's uh, chest tattooed somewhere. And we, we all kind of know it. And then, you know, it, it's, it really, really sucks when they go into like a boxing match and they lose. And you're like, I promise God is powerful. That just, that was just a thing that happened. Um, but, but we know this, this verse really, really well. And I think sometimes we, we haven't really asked ourselves the question before of, but how does he strengthen us? We know that God gives us strength. For, the, for different situations in life, and yes, even for competitions and stuff, but do we know how he strengthens us? Well, if we look at the rest of, of that passage, I think we could find out. It says this. This is a, a guy named Paul uh, going through a tough time in, in prison, okay? And so he's in prison. He's, he's not in a favorable time. And he says this to a bunch of believers that he really, really loves. He says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that, it, that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. So he's saying, I know you had a lot of concern for me. You know, I'm in prison, I'm in, I'm, I'm in tough times, uh, and I know that you were concerned, but you had no way of showing me. But he says this, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. See, Paul is telling us something um, about contentment in this. He says, I've discovered contentment in my journeys, in the highs and the lows of life. I've learned this idea of contentment. And he alludes to the fact that there, there is not satisfaction in having so much, in having plenty. Instead, he says, no, you know what? There's actually a satisfaction in contentment in contentment, in life. Now, uh, this word contentment, I think too easily it gets mixed up with another word, and, and so we misinterpret the word contentment with a word called complacency. Complacency. And these are two completely different words, so let's talk about the difference between these two words. You see, this is contentment. Contentment does not need more, but can want more. It wants more. But complacency is different. Let me show you complacency. Complacency needs things to change, but doesn't want them to. 
Complacency needs things to change but doesn't want them to. Uh, complacency is being in a place of ease of life. Uh, the, the most uh, complacent, probably, uh, uh, quote that we all know pretty well is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah, there you go. So that, that's complacency. Is, uh, well, it's working. Well, it's working. That's not contentment. See, contentment wants more. Complacency uh, will, will question every movement of progress. Co- complacency will question every movement of moving forward in life. Uh, Forbeswomen.com wrote an article about complacency. And, um, and I read through it, and it talked about women in careers and how to see if you have complacency in your life. But I, I honestly think that this uh, article, as I read it, I was like, this actually speaks to both genders. And, um, and so I, I wanted to go through the list with you guys because it actually says this. It says, it will ruin your co- career. Complacency will ruin your career. And it gave five warning signs, all right? It said this, you are complacent when... One, you are no longer aiming for your best. You are no longer aiming for your best. Uh, two, you're complacent, you're complacent if you no, you're no longer staying up to date in your field or your industry. Another one was this. It says you are not seeking or taking advantage of new opportunities. The fourth was you are not maintaining or building your friendships. And the last one was this, you don't risk sharing your opinions and ideas. You don't risk sharing your opinions and your ideas. These are the signs of complacency. And can I just tell you, God is not calling you to be a complacent person. He is not calling you toward that. We should have bigger visions today than we had before. We should want more today than we've ever wanted before, but we can't get this mixed up with our needs. Our wants are not our needs. Um, when, I was, when I was younger, I, I, whenever I wanted something, I was a kid, and whenever I wanted something, I had a tactic uh, that I would use every time we went to Costco. And, um, and I don't know if you had a tactic as a kid. Um, I bet you did to try to convince your parents to get what you want. And um, and I remember going through Costco, and I, there was this Spy Kids uh, movie that came out back in like 2001, um, and I really wanted it. And my friend, my friend George had it, and so I was like, I want it. I want the new DVD. And so what I would do is I would tell my parents, hey, can I just put it on the cart so I can look at it? We don't have to buy it. Um, but, you know, I just, I just want to, you know, keep it in the cart so we can look at it. And, like, my brain for some reason at the time was like, maybe they'll accidentally purchase it. At, at the counter, um, me not knowing, um, like, we're, we don't have a lot of money, so, th- like, we know what's in the cart. My parents are very well aware about what's in the cart, and they know when that dollar sign goes up. And, uh, but my brain was like, you know, I'll make my pitch at the very end. Um, I'll make my plea. And so I remember getting uh, to, the, to the very end of Costco, and my dad was like, hey, okay, go put this back. And I'm like, well, Dad, you see, I need it. I absolutely need it. You don't get it. George has it. He was like, I, okay, I hear you. I hear you. And I'm like, I'm almost in tears in Costco making a scene, hoping to God that he gives me this thing. And, um, and for what it's worth, we, like, we were all like weird kids. Can I just put that out there? Like, I think a lot of times I was a youth pastor for a while and parents were like, yeah, I don't know where my kid gets these like habits and things. And I'm like, well, what'd you do when you were a kid? They're like, oh man, I was, I snuck out every night. I did that. And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for sure. Like that's all of us, right? Um, but, you know, I made a scene in Costco, and I'm like, George had it, and he was like, I don't care. And so then I remember he got on one knee, and he just said, hey, bud, we, we just simply can't afford that right now. And uh, when we can, then I'll get you Spy Kids, but right now we can't. And, uh, and I remember I was in tears, and I put that over there, and then I got home, and I went to George's house and watched Spy Kids. Um, so um, it, it, it was actually, like, it worked out for everybody. But, but this is what we do as kids. We, we confuse our needs and our wants. We confuse our needs and our wants. And true com- contentment is found in seeing that our needs, our actual needs, 
are covered. Can I tell you the ultimate need that we all have that even this passage of scripture talks about? We all need Jesus. We all need Jesus. And that's what, that's what this writer is actually talking about. He's saying, I, 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 like, I've had so much and I've had so little. And I've learned that I actually need one thing. I actually need one thing. And true contentment is found in Jesus and what he gives us. And we can figure out uh, different things in our lives that he's delivered on. That he's been there. He's been the provider for our lives in so many diff- different aspects. Contentment is a state of mind that says this. I have what I need and everything else just makes it better. I have what I need and everything else just makes it better. Um, I love this. Uh, a psychologist from the University of Maryland said this. Contentment makes us, uh, makes us more likely to view our setbacks as temporary or a transition rather than defining our self-worth. Rather than defining our self-worth. This is, this is an attitude of contentment. Seeing our lives and saying, oh my gosh, like I, I've got so much that I've been given already. I can look back in my life and I can see that there's a purpose to, to the story that God is creating in me. In me. I would say this, content me, contentment sees our setbacks as catapults to what God is calling us to. Can I tell you? Go for it. Um, but uh, but uh, no, contentment, contentment will take us to what God wants us to do. Contentment will take us to the next level in our lives. This was true for a guy named David in the Bible. Now, I don't know if you know this story, but there's, there's a guy named David, and he fights a really, really big guy named Goliath. And you've probably heard this story before. He's a little guy, and we can hold off on the verse for a second. Um, he's a really, really big guy that he's going to fight. And it, it, it's this crazy thought because this, this kid's just a kid, but he has been anointed to be the next king of that nation. And they try, to, they try to put all this armor on him. They try to get him ready for this thing. And he, he takes off the armor and he says, no, all I need is, is these rocks and this slingshot. I'm going to be just fine. And with a confidence that this nation hadn't seen before, this puny little kid looks up at this giant and with a strong confidence says, I'm going to take you down today. And he grabs one of the stones and he flings it. And with just one stone, the victory is won. But sometimes we miss something that God did in David's life prior to this moment, prior to the victory that he had. God did something. And so we're going to put up this verse. This is David talking to, to people who are doubting whether he can actually pull this off. And he says this, I've been a shepherd tending sheep for my father. Whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I'd go after it, knock it down, and rescue the lamb. If it turned on me, I would grab it by the throat, wring its neck, and kill it. Lion or bear, it made no difference. I killed it. And then he says this, I will do the same to this Philistine pig who is taunting the troops of God alive. God, who delivered me from the teeth of the lion and the claws of the bear, will deliver me from this Philistine. Saul said, go and God help you. Go and God help you. What David didn't know was these these two big moments, this moment with this bear and this moment with this lion, would be preparing him for an even bigger battle And God would be saying, what I did for you back then, I can do for you again. What you've been through was not a mistake. It wasn't an accident. It was me telling you, I can do miracles. I can do crazy stuff. And no matter what you're dealing with today, you can look back and say, God, you've got me. God, you've got me. 
You see, the lion and the bear, they were preparing him for the fight that he was going to have. And the lion and the bear were catapults for the fight that God needed David to have. They were preparing him. This fight with Goliath uh, was actually the beginning of something even greater. It was the introduction of David to the nation that he would soon rule. And so what he didn't know was this, this battle was more important than just this one moment. It was setting him up for a future as the king of Israel. What has your journey been preparing you for? What has your journey been preparing you for? Because, because believe it or not, it has. It really, really has. A mentor uh, in, in my life uh, named Sarah, she, she said this one time, and I, I thought it was really great. She said, uh, if, if there is still breath in you, God is not done with you. If there is still breath in you, God is not done with you. And he is still writing that story. He has a purpose. You're not an accident. And your life is a vessel for a message that God wants to deliver to others. Your story, if, if you're sitting in this room... It's probably one where either Jesus has been somewhat present or very, very present in your life. And you've seen him and you've seen him work. And I would say that something that God seems to do very often is take us through some of these tough times that we, that we naturally just will face in this world. It's promise in this world. But can I tell you this, no matter what you've gone through, no matter what your past has looked like, it does not define your future. But it can prepare you for your future. It can prepare you for your future. There's a a passage in scripture that says this about tough times that we're going to go, messes that we're going to face. It says this, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. This is what God wants to create in your life, is perseverance, resilience, to face even more that's going to be thrown at you. I'm telling you, this world is not done throwing things at us, but God is not done fighting for us. And in in this idea of perseverance, we have to realize, we have to find a state of mind of contentment. Knowing that during, during the times where we're in our highs and the, the times when we're in our lows, all we really, really need is Jesus. And we could find contentment in that. This is the ability to see God in your life and know what he did and just know he can do it again and again and again and again. And if you were to be honest, how many times had, has God really had your back? How many times has he gotten you through something? The secret to, uh, to, to Paul's um, statement in the scripture is simply this. He actually tells us exactly what it is. He, he says that the secret of being content in, is in, no, the secret is being content in ev- any and every situation. The secret is just this. God has you now like he had you then. God has you now like he had you then. This is the secret of contentment. And no matter what you're going through, God still has you. He still has you. He hasn't changed. And he's not less powerful. And he hasn't stopped caring. Even when it feels like he has. But... For us, it's just keeping our eyes on Jesus during these seasons and finding contentment. So uh, I want to give you three practical questions of reflection, just questions of reflection to have, to just look back at our lives and say, how can I rework my mindset on, on things that have been and look at them through the eyes of contentment? So this is the first one. It it, it says this, uh, what has God brought me through? Asking yourself, what has God brought me through? 
How is he helping me? Uh, How is that helping me determine my trust in him? What has God brought me through? And how is that helping me determine my trust in him? The second one is this. What blessings would I have avoided without some of the trials in my life? What blessings would I have avoided without some of the trials in my life? I would even say this, what things have developed inside of me because of the trials of my life? And the third one is this, who can my trials and journey encourage today? Who can my trials and journey encourage today? There's a, there's, um, this, a story of a guy named Nicky Cruz. And if you've been in uh, Christianity for a while, you may have heard of this name. But uh, this guy was a guy that was brought up in Puerto Rico. And from the age of three, this kid was being abused within his family, outside of his family. He, felt tra- he, he dealt with tragedies in his life. And at nine years old, after failing to take his own life, after a, 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 a horrendous, horrendous um, abusive event that happened in his life, he finally closed himself off. He closed himself off at nine years old to anything good in life, to anything that would bring him life. And then around the age of, of 15, his dad would exile him and tell him to leave to go to New York. This kid was so traumatized that at one point, his mother in a trance called him the son of the devil and spoke that over his life. And so with all that baggage and all those problems, he goes to New York and he lives with his brother and then he leaves his brother behind and joins joins a street gang. He joins this street gang and performs horrible acts. Terrible things are going on in this gang. This guy has closed himself off to all of it. Anything good. He saw one of his friends just die in his arms. He had been through it. And then one day, there was a country pastor that came, came in and just started trying to talk to him. Now, this guy, this guy had addictions for days. He had trauma for days. He had issues for days. And this pastor, probably a little naive, goes up and says, hey, let me just tell you about Jesus. And he was like, I don't want to hear it. And one day, actually beats up the pastor. Tells him, I don't want to hear from you. Until one day, after trying and trying and trying, and this, this pastor would get back up and he'd be resilient and he would try and try and try with Nikki. And tell him, God still loves you. God is, is still, he still sees you. One day, Nikki descri- descri- describes it as like a hospital, like a spiritual hospital moment where he feels like God just revived him and gave him a different heart. And it finally got through. The message of Jesus finally got to his heart. And finally, his life was completely transformed. All because this pastor, for the longest time, wouldn't give up. Nikki would then go on and start countless organizations, speak at countless conferences. He's 85 years old today. And he has lived more of his life for Jesus than he ever lived for any gang. And through his story, and I, I remember one quote from somebody that, that went to one of the conferences, and Nikki just said, hey, I don't care what you're going through. I'm telling you, if God can redeem me, he can redeem anybody. And there was something to his message. There was something to his story that people were just captivated and said, if this could happen for him, Maybe God loves me. Through his story, lives were transformed. Things changed. This world is different because of Nikki. And I tell you, Nikki's story is one of a person who's been developed by God. Nikki's story is one of redemption. And there are people that Nikki has been able to speak to that nobody else has been able to speak to because his story 
was the key to unlocking a lot of people's perspective and hearts. I tell you, there's a, a message in your story. There's a message in your story. You didn't go through what you went through for nothing. And God wants to use that story to unlock more and more for other people. Can I ask you again, who can my trials and journey encourage today? I believe that this is the truth for you. Your mess is actually a message. Your mess is actually a message. And through the eyes of contentment and understanding that what we truly need is Jesus, through an attitude of contentment, we can look back in our past and instead of seeing it with eyes of what's wrong with it, we can look at it and say, what's the opportunity here? What are the possibilities of what my story can do in this world? What can I do for this world with what God has done in me. You can be a conduit for somebody's life change. And there's joy in this kind of contentment. There's a joy in this kind of perspective. And I believe that God wants you to find joy in your story, regardless of what it's been. So can I ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads real quick? And I I just want to create an open moment, just an open moment of just you having a conversation with God. And I'll close in prayer in just a second, but you just having an open conversation with God in your mind, maybe in your own whisper, saying, God, who do you want me to encourage with my story? God, who do you want me to encourage with my story? How do you want to use my story? And I'm going to pray that this week, He would reveal that to you because I'm telling you there's something beautiful to your story. Take 10 seconds. Just have a moment with the Lord. God, thank you for every story in this room. Thank you for a church that can be honest about its messes. Thank you for a church that wants to use every single one of our messes as a message of what you can do in a person's life, how you can transform a person's life. And Lord, I just pray that me along with everybody in this room, that we would be used by you, that we would be conduits for the message of the gospel throughout the entire area, throughout the entire community, that our lives And what you've done in our lives would be a reason that other lives can be transformed. We love you and we thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.